I wish I could stay uh, all day, but unfortunately I have to leave in a few minutes because I have a, a group uh, down in my office waiting. But I did want to come and say thank you for all the uh, great work uh, that you are doing. And I also wanted to let you know, I think uh, uh, there's some good karma. My roommate uh, at Bates College in 1982 uh, was a Greek national. Uh, in fact, he still lives there to this day. His name was Akondis Pantios. Uh, and he now works as the provost at the American University at Thessaloniki. Okay. So uh, I'm looking forward. He keeps inviting me to come out and visit. Should I go? Yes. 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 Well, thank you guys. <laughs> I just want to say uh, one thing. I just want to read to you from uh, a letter uh, that I had written to uh, the chair of the committee in support of this bill because I think it encapsulates uh, what this bill is all about and I think what you're here today. Uh, it has been said that no problem in the world poses the question on what it means to be human quite like genocide, because genocide is not simply about killing people, but about destroying humanity. The goal of this legislation is to teach that genocide is not just somebody else's story. Indeed, it's not simply history, but a warning. By including genocide in the curriculum, we will give students a better understanding of the human condition and increase efforts worldwide for preventing further genocides. So let me thank you for being here today. Thank you for promoting uh, your story and telling your story and getting it out to the world. And I hope that uh, this bill does indeed pass so that we can get this story out to the generations of citizens who will take over this world in the next few years. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Roy. And as I mentioned to a few people earlier, not to put any undue uh, pressure on him, 
Uh, Representative Roy was recently appointed by the Speaker of the House to chair the uh, Committee on Higher Education. So, so I've added extra pressure for some important education bills. Uh, the next gentleman, as I referenced earlier, is our authority, our Greek authority here uh, in the House of Representatives, first elected in 1978, responsible for the Greek Independence Day in 1980. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce a colleague and friend, Representative and Chair Spiliotis. Teach him one word of petty stuff. <laughs> And the only other word that's important in this building is lefta. <laughs> uh, then that means do we have any money? I, I, I mean baklava. Oh, that's, that works for me. It's a long way from money, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, uh, let me welcome you as well and thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, I think if you take away one thing from today, is the ability for us in the United States to understand the rest of the world. We've changed since 9-11. We now understand a great deal more about the importance of religion, the importance of history, the importance of traditions. Uh, we didn't understand that before. I'd like to share one quick story with you. In the late 90s, President Clinton attacked Milosevic, and the Greek government was upset at that. And we had an event in Salem, Mass, in which George Stephanopoulos was the keynote speaker. And the Greek Consul General, with no uncertain terms, let me have it. And as a representative of our United States, he was upset at me and everyone else that was within the party of President Clinton. And I came back a few days later and sat in the back of the chamber and was telling a few of my friends in the legislature of what happened and told them, quite frankly, how uncomfortable it was. And one gentleman who served here for quite a few years was an was a practicing attorney and very successful, immediately said, what do we care about religion? And it really hit me hard. And it made me realize that when the United States discusses foreign policy, we talk about the economic gains, about the value of property, resources, human life, labor. We don't talk about the traditions and the history, the culture, the religion of a people. We talk only about the economic value of that particular region. And that's where we are so far behind the rest of the world and why so many times our foreign policy so well-intentioned errors. And that's why it's so important to understand that there's a different world that the rest of the world, different thought process the rest of the world has. And today, we try to explain to our constituents what the rest of the people feel about us. And that's what's really important. Not just, and we teach them through our hardship, through what we went through, and the difficulties that people went through. That's what today is about teaching our young children what we and our families went through so that they can understand and not repeat these errors. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Representative Roy, and Chairman Roy. Uh, and you can see why I'm so proud to serve with both of these individuals, incredibly knowledgeable, and uh, appreciate you both being here. Uh, and George, as a president uh, of the society, come on over. I want to join my colleagues here. Um, we have an official citation that we want to make a quick presentation before you begin your symposium. It reads, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the House of Representatives, be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to the Pontian Society of Boston in recognition of solemn remembrance of the 100th anniversary of the genocide of Pontian Greeks 
The entire membership extend its very best wishes and express a hope for future good fortune and continued success. I know you've already made a difference there at the Society. I wish you well in the years and the decades to come. It's given this 20th day of May, signed by the Speaker of the House, and be proudly as your representative along with my colleagues in the legislature. But thanks for doing what you're doing today. have to uh, attend other obligations. I thank them once again for joining us. And ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, your host for the rest of this uh, symposium and uh, the president of the Pontian Society, Mr. George Elaturidis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Before we start, um, I would like uh, the Consul General of Greece in Boston to say a few words. Consul General Stratos Eftimiu. Good morning. Uh, distinguished uh, representatives, uh, scholars, dear friends. Uh, I would like to uh, express, first of all, my appreciation to George Yalturidis and to all the members of the Pontian Society, Panagia Sumela. This is really praiseworthy. Congratulations for all your work. This resolution is a historic step towards the recognition of the genocide, the international recognition of the genocide. And I would like also to extend my sincere thanks to the distinguished academics who take part in today's uh, symposium. Um, as I was uh, uh, saying to Hello before. Uh, my family uh, too comes from Asia Minor. Uh, they are all from uh, Sparta, from uh, Pisidia, and uh, we share your uh, pain and similar stories. Uh, they were forced to leave their, uh, their lands. They were forced to uh, take boats uh, under difficult conditions, uh, under tragic uh, conditions, and uh, we, uh, we understand very well the, the pain of the Pontian uh, Greeks, who I think among, among all the Greeks of uh, Asia Minor, I think they suffered the most. They were not only the ones, but I think it's a, it's a, the Pontian genocide is a very uh, special uh, genocide. Uh, and this is a very timely uh, initiative, since we remember today the 100 years since uh, the genocide genocide that was unanimously uh, recognized by the Greek parliament in 1994. Uh, today we remember, we study, we analyze, and we make known to the wider American public uh, the genocide of the Greeks of Pontus, a historic fact, which is not only a, a dark page of the Turkish history, but it's also a dark page of the world history. So your initiative is very important for many reasons because you shed light on a, a tragic, on the most tragic moment of Pontian Greeks, uh, because you raise awareness on the, on the genocide, because you contribute to the internalization of the issue, and because you honor the memory uh, of the victims. Uh, I would like to say a few words also in, uh, in, in Greek, Συγχαρητήρια στον Σύλλογο Παναγία Σουμελά. Είναι μια ιδιαίτερα άξια και είναι η πρωτοβουλία αυτή που λαμβάνετε. Έχετε μια πολύ αξιόλογη δραστηριότητα και σας χαίρω. Ε, φίλες και φίλοι, οι Έλληνες και οι Πόντι, ε, είμαστε ένας φιλήσιχος λαός. Θέλουμε την ειρήνη, θέλουμε τη συνεργασία με όλους τους λαούς της περιοχής και επιδιώκουμε την συνύπαρξη σε ένα πλαίσιο ε, συνεργασίας και ειρήνης. Η προϋπόθεση όμως για όλα αυτά είναι ο σεβασμός του διεθνούς δικαίου ε, και βεβαίως η οικονομική μας πάρα η Τουρκία να σέβεται τα κυριαρχικά μας δικαιώματα στο Αιγαίο αλλά και στην Κύπρο και να μην συμπεριφέρεται ως πειρατής. Ε, προϋπόθεση επίσης είναι 
Από πλευρά μα, η αντίσταση στη λύθη, ο σεβασμό τη ιστορία και η διατήρηση τη εθνική μα μνήμη. Η Βουλή των Ελλήνων με το νόμο 2193 του 1994 αναγνώρισε ομόφωνα την γενοκτονία των Ελλήνων του Πόντου και θέσπισε την 19η Μαου μέρα μνήμη για τα τραγικά θύματα. Τα μελέτα βουρού, οι αναγκαστικοί εκτοπισμοί, η εγκληματική δράση των ατάκτων, η τρομοκρατία του διαβόλου του Τοπάλου Σμαν θα μείνουν ανεξίδηλα γραμμένα στην ιστορία των Ποντίων, στην ιστορία τη Ελλάδα και στην παγκόσμια ιστορία. Και ω ερημίε θα κυνηγάνε του θήτε των αποτρόπων αυτών εγκλημάτων μέχρι να διατυπωθεί μια επίσημη συγγνώμη και να βρούνε τα θύματα δικαίωση και ανάπαυση. I, I referred to the massive deportations, to the tragic and terrorist activities of Al Osman and to uh, the memory uh, to the memory of the victims that uh, demands and requests and deserves and, and apologize uh, so that they can rest in peace. Uh, thank you very much for your initiative. Thank you uh, again, Mr. Ephemiu. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative McMurtry, Representative McMurtry staff, distinguished panel, Mr. Panel moderator, Father Constantine, Professor Bolliconu, members of the board of directors of the society, Panagias from Love Austin, friends of the society. Fellow Greeks, fellow Pontian Greeks, friends of Pontian Greeks, welcome to the first symposium on the genocide of the Pontian Greeks. Again, we thank Representative McMurtry for helping us hold it in this conference room in the State House. Of course, we also thank. Representative Roy, who introduced House Bill 566 on genocide education in Massachusetts. We also thank Senator Michael Roderick, who introduced the same bill on the Senate, Bill, Senate, uh, bill 327 in the Senate. Today, the genocide of the Pontian Greeks will become a case study for genocides throughout the history of this planet. It was the first final solution of the 20th century. Another final solution followed in Europe 20 or so years later. This was the first one. But on this one, there were no Nuremberg trials to follow. No perpetrators were punished. Some were even rewarded. Was it an ethnocathesis, an ethnic cleansing? Was it a religious catharsis? Or was it both? It was both. If you were not Turkish and you were not Muslim, you had to go. One way or another, you had to go. How do they eradicate the Greek element, the Armenian element, the Assyrian element? Altogether, over two and a half million victims. 1.1 million Greeks, out of which 353,000 were from Pontus the southern shores of the Black Sea. Almost one more million Greeks in other parts of Asia Minor. One and a half million Armenians and close to 300,000 Assyrians. Why? Because they were Christian. They were not Muslim. They were not Turkish. Slaughter, deportations, slave labor, death marches, orchestrated 
because we have similarities here with Germany. It started back then. In World War I, the Ottoman Empire was an ally of Germany. And the person who headed the Ottoman army in World War I was German General Otto Lehmann von Sanders. He was the person who orchestrated the entire process. Don't slaughter them here. They're going to see you. Send them out into death marches. Send them out in the cold of winter through the mountains. No food, no water, destitute, hungry, thirsty, very low clothing. They're not going to last long if that's what happened. Jigsawing through the mountains of Asia Minor. This way, there's no evidence of what happened to them. And what we're going to say is, war casualties, <coughs> disease, starvation. Well, that's what they're saying up to today. There were war casualties. Forced labor was used as a method of torture and murder. Amelet Tamburu is what they called the work battalions. They would take Greek and Armenian soldiers outside, take them out of the Ottoman army, and they would arm them with picks and shovels, and they would send them to the interior. Again, very little food, very little clothing, very little water. How long can they last? Maybe one out of 99 returned. My grandfather on my mom's side was one of them. Work battalions. We see pictures of the gates of Auschwitz, Dachau, Schachtenhausen, Arbeit macht frei. Work shall set you free. Work battalions, work shall set you free. Death chambers disguised as work. As you can see, Hitler had a very, very good teacher in Mustafa Kemal. And of course, advised by Otto Lehmann von Sanders. In those death marches, very few survived. You couldn't go anymore. If anybody tried to help you, they would be shot. Humanity in a wasteland of inhumanity. You would think they had one foot in the tube. No, it was life in the tomb. No different than being buried alive. You know your time is up. That's how they all were. Fortunately, some survived. What happened to them? They had to be forced out of their homeland of 3,000 years. Forced out, it wasn't voluntary. And they had to become refugees in another continent. Today, we are here not just to remember, but to recognize The men, women, and children who perished under those despicable conditions. We are here to honor them posthumously. We are here to liberate them posthumously because only recognition can liberate them. Now I present to you the panel moderator, Boston University professor of journalism, Lou Uranev. He is the author of the extraordinary book on Smyrna, The Great Catastrophe, Smyrna, The Great Fire. Thank you for participating in the panel. Also offer my welcome to all of you here to this
this important event and uh, to say how uh, proud and honored I am to be participating in this as a moderator and as an introducer. I want to salute the Pontic Society for what they brought together here this afternoon. It really is an extraordinary program and an extraordinary panel. Um, it um, is heartening to see that it's being videotaped so that others can share in what we're about to learn this afternoon. Uh, George has assembled uh, really an astonishing panel from throughout the country uh, of scholars who will be sharing their, their wisdom and their knowledge with us um, this afternoon. A couple of things in terms of protocol, how this afternoon will unfold. It's going to be an interesting afternoon, but it's also going to be a long afternoon. Uh, George has asked for the panelists to remain at the front through the afternoon. People can gum and go as necessary, uh, but all of the panelists will be there and then they will speak uh, in sequence through the afternoon. I'll mention everybody's name at the outset and provide a longer introduction before each person uh, comes up to speak and address the topic. Um, George asked me also to say a few words uh, about the topic by way of introduction, things that I've learned in the writing of the book and the research. Now, the first thing I'd like to say that this is this event, the genocide that swept Asia Minor late in the 19th and early in the 20th centuries, uh, is thoroughly understudied and um, misunderstood and not well enough known uh, to the people of America and up to the world. Many of you already know that. So the question is, why is that? Well, one obvious reason uh, is the Turkish government's distortions and dis denials uh, relating to the events of the genocide. Some people also know that uh, the American government, early on, soon following the genocide, especially in the 1920s, had a strong interest in building a commercial relationship with Turkey, diplomatic and commercial relationship, and so the American government early on played a role in suppressing news and information about the genocide. And um, one of the things that I learned after the writing of the book is um, the extent to which Greece itself, uh, I'm wandering into controversial territory here, but I will do so nonetheless, um, the extent to which Greece itself has participated in the silence surrounding the genocide in Asia Minor. Uh, I found a dearth of Greek scholarship on the subject, uh, and there aren't many Greek narratives on the subject of, of what happened in Asia Minor in those years. And there seems to have been, there seems to have developed through the years a kind of alliance between what I would call the Greek establishment, the Greek government at various levels, and academia in Greece, not to fully explore this topic for fear of igniting feelings of nationalism and so forth. And uh, so Greece itself has become an impediment, at least in the past. And the debate continues to rage in Greece about what happened in Asia Minor. I salute the society for opening up the discussion and encouraging scholarship and conversation. Finally, I'd like to say it's appropriate, I think, that such an important conference is taking place in Boston. Uh, many of you may know, some of you may not, that Boston played a very important role in the connection between the United States and Asia Minor in those years. Uh, the American Missionary Societies here in Boston sent many teachers, nurses, doctors, um, clinicians, and so forth. And many of the people who were from Boston, many Bostonites and young women from Mount Holyoke and Wellesley and other colleges of those years were actually witnesses to what happened in Asia Minor in those, um, those terrible years. So uh, Boston is a good place for this, this uh, first program to be unfolding. Um, now, as I say, the, the program uh, will extend uh, through 4 o'clock this afternoon. We're going to have speakers in sequence, and then the final hour of the afternoon will be a panel discussion. We are also going to leave about 15 minutes or so after each speaker's presentation for questions from the audience. So we'd like very much for this to be interactive and for people to ask questions. And if you have statements to make, to make them, but to keep those uh, statements brief. 
Um, the, uh, the, the speakers that we have today, I'm just going to mention their names and then I'll come back and provide more extensive uh, introductions, is we have Thea Halo, Dr. Robert Shank, Fanula Argiru, Dr. Alan Benmir, who can't be with us, unfortunately, uh, a scholar of the genocide, but he's having health problems, so he has sent along a statement uh, that George will read. Um, then we're going to take a break. Stavros uh, Kalanchitridis, Nina Gatsoulis, uh, Leonidas Raptakis um, will finish the program, and then we'll have our, our panel uh, discussion. 